Together with our brethren in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we are waiting for the soon coming of the Lord. And prophetic events are taking place all around us. And they're most evident in the political world. And so there is this kind of idea among us that we should participate in politics. As Adventists, we actually find that we are not supposed to be involved in politics. And this is one of the differences that now exists between the reform movement and the mainline SDA church. So we're going to examine a couple things here. What is our civic duty? What can we vote for? Like, can we vote for political parties? Can we vote for anything at all? Could a member be disciplined or disfellowshipped from the church for voting for political parties? And finally, how does the separation of church and state impact our participation in the political system? So let's start out with an examination of what is our civic duty. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 21, we read, They say unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. In Romans chapter 13, we find that our participation must be something that we are careful with. In Romans 13, starting in verse 1, it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So of ourselves, we must respect the government. Of ourselves, we must understand that government was placed over us by God. And this respect extends to our participation in society at large, to paying our taxes, to obeying the laws of the land. We have this responsibility. But do we get involved in political things? Are we supposed to be involved in revolution? Are we supposed to be involved in social change? Well, the example that we find from Christ is that he saw terrible things happening around him. But he never sought political change. He simply sought to help those who were suffering, help those who were in need, help those who were being abused and taken advantage of by society at large. This work we are called to do, to aid those who are suffering, to comfort those who are in sorrow. This is our work. But in Desire of Ages, it clarifies that Adventists follow the position that Christ used. Let's read. It's page 509 of Desire of Ages. It says, The government under which Jesus lived was corrupt and oppressive. On every hand there were crying abuses, extortion, intolerance, and grinding cruelty. Yet the Savior attempted no civil reforms. He attacked no national abuses, nor condemned the national enemies. He did not interfere with the authority or administration of those in power. He, who was our example, kept aloof from earthly governments, not because he was indifferent to the woes of men, but because the remedy did not lie in merely human and external measures. To be efficient, the cure must reach men individually and must regenerate the heart. Let's understand here then that the work of Jesus was to aid the oppressed, but it was never in any way to be involved in the politics of his time. And he's our example. The statement we just read says that he's our example and we're to follow the same example ourselves. Aid the oppressed individually. We are not called to participate in the politics of this world. Jesus confirms this in John chapter 18, verses 36 and 37. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, 
thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. Do you understand? Following after the example of Christ, we are part of the kingdom of heaven. We are not part of the kingdoms of this world. So in this world, we have been called to preach the truth. Jesus said he came to give the truth to mankind. That is our purpose here. Being involved in politics and political parties, this is not the calling of God's people. In Desire of Ages, on page 509, the second paragraph says, But today in the religious world, there are multitudes who, as they believe, are working for the establishment of the kingdom of Christ as an earthly and temporal dominion. They desire to make our Lord the ruler of the kingdoms of this world, the ruler in the courts and camps, its legislative halls, its palaces and marketplaces. They expect him to rule through legal enactments enforced by human authority. Since Christ is not now here in person, they themselves will undertake to act in his stead, to execute the laws of his kingdom. The establishment of such a kingdom is what the Jews desired in the days of Christ. They would have received Jesus had he been willing to establish a temporal dominion to enforce what they regarded as the laws of God and to make them the expositors of his will and the agents of his authority. But he said, my kingdom is not of this world. In John 18, 36, it was clearly stated, he would not accept the earthly throne. Our work then is not a work of politics. So what is the work? In John chapter 17, verse 15 and 16, it says, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. We are not of this place. We have a greater calling. So can we vote for political parties? The instruction given by the servant of the Lord that's recorded in Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 478, would say that we cannot. It reads like this. I call upon my brethren who are appointed to educate, to change their course of action. It is a mistake for you to link your interests with any political party, to cast your vote with them or for them. Those who stand as educators, as ministers, as laborers together with God in any line have no battles to fight in the political world. Their citizenship is in heaven. The Lord calls upon them to stand as separate and peculiar people. He would have no schisms in the body of believers. His people are to possess the elements of reconciliation. Is it their work to make enemies in the political world? No, no. They are to stand as subjects of Christ's kingdom, bearing the banner on which is inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They are to carry the burden of a special work, a special message. We have a personal responsibility, and this is to be revealed before the heavenly universe, before angels and before men. God does not call upon us to enlarge our influence by mingling with society, by linking up with men on political questions, but by standing as individual parts of his great whole. With Christ as our head, Christ is our prince, and as his subjects, we are to do the work appointed us by God. So we can see that we are not to be involved in political parties. And in Fundamentals of Christian Education, the same book, on page 475, paragraph 2, it continues like this. The Lord would have his people bury political questions. On these themes, silence is eloquence. Christ calls upon his followers to come into unity on the pure gospel principles which are plainly revealed in the word of God. We cannot with safety vote for political parties, for we do not know whom we are voting for. 
We cannot with safety take part in any political schemes. We cannot labor to please men who will use their influence to repress religious liberty and to set in operation oppressive measures to lead or compel their fellow men to keep Sunday as the Sabbath. The first day of the week is not a day to be reverenced. It is a spurious Sabbath, and the members of the Lord's family cannot participate with the men who exalt this day and violate the law of God by trampling upon His Sabbath. The people of God are not to vote to place such men in office. For when they do this, they are partakers with them of the sins which they commit while in office. Do you understand? If you vote for political parties, if you vote for politicians linked to political parties, when you vote to give away your sovereignty to them, God holds you accountable for the decisions that they have made. You cannot say, oh, the government decided to do this. When you voted, you told the Lord that you would be well pleased with the decisions that they made. So we have been called not to participate in these political schemes. This is confirmed again in Gospel Workers, page 395, paragraph 3. It says, God's children are to separate themselves from politics, from any alliance with unbelievers. They are not to link their interests with the interests of the world. Give proof of your allegiance to me, God says, by standing as my chosen heritage, as a people zealous of good works. Do not take part in political strife. Separate from the world and refrain from bringing into the church or school ideas that will lead to confrontation and disorder. Dissension is the moral poison taken into the system by human beings who are selfish. God wants His servants to have clear perception, true and noble dignity, that their influence may demonstrate the power of truth. So, can we vote for anything at all? Like, is there anything that we can vote for? Well, we have to distinguish between voting for people and political parties from voting for issues. That is direct democracy, where you are accountable for your own vote. Uh, for example, I live in the state of California. And in the state of California, we have a lot of propositions. Every year, when there's the election in November, we have a number of ballot measures which are presented as propositions. And on these individual issues, I may be called upon to vote upon those issues. But in general, do I vote for individuals? No, but I can vote for issues that are presented directly to me. In Review and Herald, October 15, 1914, it says, While we are in no wise to become involved in political questions, yet it is our privilege to take our stand decidedly on all questions relating to temperance reform. Concerning this, I have often borne a plain testimony. Again, Review and Herald, October 15, 1914, it says, we may call upon the friends of the temperance cause to rally to the conflict and seek to press back the tide of evil that is demoralizing the world. But of what avail are all our efforts while liquor selling is sustained by law? Must the curse of intemperance forever rest like a blight upon our land? Must it every year sweep like a devouring fire over thousands of happy homes? We talk of the results, tremble at the results, and wonder what we can do with the terrible results, while too often we tolerate and even sanction the cause. The advocates of temperance fail to do their whole duty unless they exert their influence by precept and example, by voice and pen and vote in favor of prohibition and total abstinence. We need not expect that God will work a miracle to bring about this reform and thus remove the necessity of our exertion. We ourselves must grapple with this giant foe. Our motto, no compromise and no cessation, 
of our efforts till the victory is gained. So while we don't vote for political parties and we don't vote for individuals, we do when a specific issue is presented before us, such as the temperance issue was in the example that we just saw, we can exercise our vote for individual issues given directly to us. So what should we do with somebody who is politically active in church, who tries to bring political questions into the church, who tries to convince others to join political parties and vote for politicians? Can a member be disciplined or disfellowshipped for voting for a political party? The short answer is no, but if you bring it into the church, we have the, rem the right to remove you from positions of responsibility. For this is a place of peace and not a place of strife. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 337. He who breaks one precept of the commandments of God is a transgressor of the whole law. Keep your voting to yourself. Do not feel it your duty to urge everyone to do as you do. And again, in Gospel Workers, page 393. Those teachers in the church or in the school who distinguish themselves by their zeal in politics should be relieved of their work and responsibilities without delay. For the Lord will not cooperate with them. The tithe should not be used to pay anyone for speechifying on political questions. Every teacher, minister, or leader in our ranks who is stirred with the desire to ventilate his opinions on political questions should be converted by a belief in the truth or give up his work. His influence must tell as a laborer together with God in winning souls to Christ or his credentials must be taken from him. If he does not change, he will do harm and only harm. Someone who is involved in political questions is unconverted. We need to help them in their spiritual life. How does the separation of church and state impact our participation in the political system? Well, in prophecy, we know and understand that events are going to take place soon. And if we're involved in the political system, that means that we're going to be part of those evils which are taking place upon the land. So in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 451, we have clear instruction. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. The end is near. And we need to understand that God is calling us to be separate from this world. In 1 John 2.15, the apostle appeals to us, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You need to choose today who you're going to serve. Whose servant are you? Whose kingdom do you belong to? Whose kingdom is yours? If it is the kingdom of God, then you have no involvement in the politics of this world.